Uh, my name is uh, Olga Mink, I'm the director of Balton Laboratories and um, uh, one of the initiators of the Economia uh, Festival. And Economia is a festival about uh, the economy uh, without economists on stage. Uh, we see it as a lab for ideas and where we can step out of our current frames of thinking and approach uh, our economy in a playful and fundamental way. Uh, economics organized by Balton Laboratories. Uh, we are a place for artistic research and development that connects ideas, people, and organizations. And with Economia, we try to uh, look at uh, value and economic growth from a fresh and a more detached point of view. And as such, we want to rec reclaim our economy and uh, rid us of the idea that the economy is an inevitable law of nature. Uh, we think the current model is broken and the pandemic emphasized this in many ways. Uh, also, our economies are exhausting our planet. It has no answers to climate change or social inequality. And economic growth comes at the expense of all living species. And this is why we want to discuss this topic and invite everyone to collectively develop alternative ideas. So. Thank you all for joining today for the second part. And now I give the word to Kun Snooks, our moderator. Hi, thank you, Olga, for this introduction. And welcome back to those of you who were here for the first session. And welcome for those of you who join now uh, for this second part. Um, as has already been introduced as well this morning, the Economia Festival, as well as this conference, is centered around three themes. Uh, one is redesigning infrastructures, the other is shifting values, and the other is nature's economies. And um, this morning session was about redesigning infrastructures. And this afternoon, during this afternoon session, we will have five speakers that are uh, in one way or another connected to the topic of shifting values. Now, uh, before we start, uh, I have one practical uh, question to ask. As you might notice, uh, Baldan is recording this session, um, first of all, for internal use afterwards, but also maybe to uh, share part of it, parts of it or entirely uh, afterwards with the public. Um, in case you uh, object to this, uh, please uh, send a message to Baldan so that they can take into account your concerns uh, when handling this video recording. Um, and then before we, we move to the speakers, as I said today, this afternoon session or this second session will be about shifting values. And um, what I want to do first is ask Lorenzo Gerbi, who is one of the curators of the Economia Festival in this conference. I want to ask him, like, what does Baltan intend with shifting values? Yeah, thanks, Kuhn, for the for the question. Yeah, I think when we were looking at the things, so if I don't know, some some of you was jo joining already this morning, we we said, okay, maybe economy in itself is something very big to change. Maybe we can change part of it. So this morning was about changing the blocks uh, that, that we already have in society, like health, work, uh, insurance. So, so the substructure of the big structure, which is economy, because maybe yeah, changing it. Uh, totally it's very difficult on another way I think we should shifting values is about if we cannot change this uh, rhetoric and this narrative of growth maybe we can change what kind of things we want to grow maybe it's not about just a monetary value or maybe it's about uh, our happiness our the well-being of nature of, of, of uh, ourselves. so in the end it's it's maybe looking at how we can shift, besides changing the concept of growth that is very embedded in our psychology, we keep that fixed and we change what we want then to grow. And then uh, for us, that would mean uh, uh, saving maybe the planet from an environmental crisis, but also make ourselves happier and more fulfilled in a limited environment, as, as, as we discussed this morning. So it's just shifting one part of it, so shifting the, the, the bigger narrative. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lorenzo. And as I also already mentioned this morning, uh, it might or might not come to us as a surprise to some of you, but as you will uh, obviously understand, 
the Economia Festival is not just without the economist on stage, it's also not just about the economy. So thank you, Lorenzo, for um, giving us a little bit of background on the themes that you've chosen and specifically this one. Um, then uh, another practical thing, we will now move into the speaker sessions and we will have uh, five speakers lined up for you. Each of them will speak for uh, more or less 10 minutes. And um, if you have questions for these speakers, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, you can hold on to your questions until that point, or you can post them in the chat, either as a public message or as a private message to me. So uh, feel free to share your questions and we will certainly uh, deal with them or as much of them as possible at the end of this session. So um, the, uh, you mentioned, uh, Lorenzo, that it's about maybe not uh, challenging the notion of growth, but redefining what exactly we want to uh, grow. And our first speaker uh, will talk about motivation architecture and the social design canvas tool and which illustrates or, or which makes me think that maybe we should have motivation as a growth factor uh, to look at and not something else. Um, but before I announce this first speaker, I have another uh, practical security warning because despite all background checks and security measures that have been taken by Valpam, our next speaker works for the world's largest investment management company. So I think there did someone with economic uh, affiliation slip through uh, the net, but uh, now that he's in, I'm very happy to announce him. His uh, name is Attila Puchdozo, if I pronounce that correctly. And uh, he's gonna explain us all about motivation, I guess. So Attila, welcome, and the screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, do you see my screen? Uh, no, probably not. Mm. Yep, now we do. You see it full screen? Yep. All right, so thanks so much, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for Baltan for organizing the festival. My name is Attila Buida Show. Uh, I will speak about my concept motivation architecture. Um, I'm a designer based in Budapest and I work really to one of the largest, actually the largest uh, investment management company in the world, but this work is not affiliated with that company and I will not talk about that. And also I'm a designer, I work for this company, so I'm, I'm not an economist. So I, hopefully I qualify for, for the talk. Um, and I, last year I published a book uh, called Social Design Cookbook, uh, which, which is summarizing a research that I've been concluding in, over the past uh, few years. Uh, we, in, in its research, I, uh, I was looking, we were looking, it was a collaborative effort, uh, which I was leading uh, recipes uh, for social cooperation. And more specifically, we were looking at um, what we call replicable format of social cooperations. What are these and why do I care about it? And uh, I used to, I was actively involved in many of social cooperative initiatives. I used to organize Pachekucha Night, I was creating Subject League Atlas, this book series in Hungary. I was working at the Media Lab, but I was not, not only involved in these, but I, I, I witnessed these kind of social projects, even initiatives uh, popping up, both in Budapest, in my hometown, but also uh, uh, internationally. And I, I started to look at this as a, uh, and I was interested, like why this, this phenomenon is happening. So I started the research project and we, start, we started by identifying what these are and basically these, what we call replicable formats of social corporations. Uh, they are basically um, social in initiatives that bring people together to create some sort of value. Uh, and they do this, uh, by uh, engaging people who are not motivated by monetary means. So they do this for, for, for their interest, but not monetary interest. Um, and these practices become consolidated over time. Usually they are centered around this, uh, an idea or concept or format, uh, which then becomes replicated as a practice and spreads globally. And if you think about this uh, events, you know, or we all know meetups and restaurant days and fab labs. This has been studied in so many times uh, when it comes to social production. Um, so, so we, look, we did a look on that and we analyzed 
18 case studies, more, we analyzed more, but the 18 case studies were ended up in, uh, being featured in the book. And what, what these projects, these social initiatives exemplify is what Yohei Blanker calls as the, as the increasing, this increasing feasibility spa space between the state and, and the businesses and the market. So basically, uh, uh, this, this kind of NGO social production, peer production uh, space, uh, which is different from both state and, and business in the time that it's not driven by money and it's not run by money. How businesses run, obviously they need capital to run. Uh, they give you an interest back. State is also needs, uh, public services need uh, uh, money to run. How they get this, they get this by taxation. But the social cooperative project, they by obviously sometimes use money, but it's not, they are not mainly about money. And the question is like, what, what are the things that they run on? And we started to look at this, um, this project and we, we analyzed, like we looked at the, how they were started, why they were started and how they spread globally. But even more interested, I was more interested in understanding how they work, how they are organized. And it's easier to, it's easy to say like, like how they are not organized. So again, uh, referring back to Yohei Blankler, he, he's like look, looked at social production as like uh, basically, uh, creating ways that pe where people uh, participate, which are not driven by monetary uh, motivations. Because they do so, this is not related or is not applying the, the logics of the labor market. And also how these social projects are organized, they are not managed from top. They are not managed by common, like the state or, the, or, or companies are. And also they, they don't uh, uh, rely on the concept of contract. So they're not, they're not contract based. They, you, even sometimes they're not even legal entities. Um, and in, in this research, what we kind of recognized, we looked at patterns and what we uh, identified that in this project, you can typically identify a limited number, usually three to six uh, uh, participant types. And another thing that we recognize that these, are, like, these roles can be really, these type, participant types, and they have really distinct roles, which can be kind of uh, very well defined. And also the level of engagement is kind of, um, um, uh, inversely correlate. So like you have a few people who work a lot and then usually have, you have more people who work less, which is quite obvious because not many people will be very motivated to work in a, in a, in a fab lab, but the, you will eventually find few people who are very motivated and, and put a lot of work to, into it. Um, and this was more on the research part, but I'm a designer as I said in the beginning. And I, I looked at like how we could create, how we could design such a social project and um, when in one of one of our um, one of, one of the case uh, in one of the interviews in the book is Harman Zaip, who is a co-founder of the Fab Lab in Amersfoort, and he, he made this phrase that we should uh, he we shouldn't talk about business model, but we should talk about rewarding model. And I think this is the kind of the question: like, what was the was the engine behind? Was the was the logic behind? Um, and why this is relevant? Because I think we all agree that there are so many problems in the world which cannot or probably will not be able to, we cannot solve by having a business model because there is just no business model for it. Um, and so, so I, 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 put my, I put my designer hat on and like ask how we could design social projects. Obviously we have to design for motivations. If people are motivated to contribute, the project will flourish. If not, then they will not. So easy. Um, and uh, as, a, as I'm a designer and I tr like, like to think about theory, I looked at different uh, definitions of design and one of them is, is highlighting this very important aspect of design is the, the, the blueprint, the, the planning part. So basically that we are creating a, a blueprint or, or a plan to visualize, document, communicate uh, our, our thinking uh, uh, and, and on, on which we can also reflect upon and, and, and test and proto prototype and test. Um, now the problem is because I, I'm, by training I'm an architect, so they will really learn how to document and draw blueprints and plans for our buildings. But how does it come for uh, for social uh, social uh, projects, social initiatives? How you, can you map that? Um, and I came up with this concept, motivation architecture, which is the the structural, the soft structural uh, design of a social system, which is focusing on on social initiatives systems. On, on the participants involved, their contributions and motivations, and also because it's a social setting, their interrelations 
and relations to each other and to the collective effort as, at large, um, this, this whole concept uh, is, is aiming to describe that. It's a social setting um, and it was a challenge is that, again, it, these are projects where people join for different reasons. So the motivations are diverse, both within act, act, uh, participants life, also individual actors and also across the different actors. And uh, I use an ins inspiration, which is quite straightforward. I, I'm sure many of you know it, uh, the business for the canvas, which was uh, drafted and created by uh, Alexander Osterwalder and, uh, and his collaborators, which aims to depict a business model on a, on a single piece of paper. Uh, it's again, it's a representation of it, which is not never full, but it's still very useful. But if, it's, if you look at it in the details, it comes down really well to the, this idea of the business model if, if your revenues uh, exceed your cost, it's a viable business model. If not, you might need capital or investors, uh, but otherwise that this is the main important uh, factor. Now, what, what, what's in it for us for social projects? I would say th this balance, which I, for businesses, it's about cost and revenue. For social projects, it's about contribution of participants and the motivation. And this is what we kind of have to make sure it's balanced. And this is what we try to, to map out. Uh, over a course of a couple of years, we did uh, many workshops to, to at, at, at uh, events in, in, in several countries in Europe uh, to kind of help form this, idea, this, this way of visualizing and mapping. And we landed up on social design canvas. So it's basically the nonprofit equivalent of business on the canvas. And it's, it's a representation of social projects. Uh, uh, and, and the beauty of it that you can actually map social projects, social initiatives, social systems, uh, large and small. So you can map your daughter's birthday party, but also a political demonstration. So it's kind of a very, very flexible tool. And it, if you use this idea of ingredients, kind of a metaphor to recipes, um, and which includes contributors, their contributions, motivations, enablers, uh, rules and tools. And in the book, uh, then when we developed this tool, then we decided to use the tool to map all the case studies that are presented in the book, 18 of them. Uh, this is one example, for instance, mapping restaurant day. And what I would like to highlight is that for each of the participants and participants types, uh, we have to make sure again, if their contributions and motivations are not in balance, that means they will not participate or will stop participating. But if this social initiatives are successful and sustainable, this means that the, the model is actually working. Uh, in the book, we dedicated one section on, on, on using this tool and kind of telling the concept. Uh, on our website, we published the guide, how to use it, you can download it for free, you can download the chapter for free. And also we run some workshops, uh, both in social settings, but also in business settings using this tool. And finally, I just want to share uh, that on the website, socialdesigncookbook.com, you can actually uh, download the, free, uh, the, the canvas and, and the free guide and the free chapter. You can also order the book and there is a discount code, PhD question mark, because I have a plan to do some PhD, continue exploring motivation architecture. So if you have any ideas or, or connections or suggestions or a, a context that it would be relevant, I'm happy to uh, get in touch with you. That's all, thank you so much. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Attila, and um, I appreciate your information as much as your question for help. I think it's really nice that also you make use of this stage to see if the audience or the people that are in this room can help you out. So uh, thanks for that. Um, I think our next speaker turns social care into art or art into social care. Uh, so I give her the floor and I'm very curious uh, how she will inspire us. Jody, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, everything you're saying rings true to me um, about these anti-poverty support agencies. You know, are they really solving poverty or are they kind of self-perpetuating? Um, so I am going to um, share a little bit about my work. Um, I'm an artist based in New York. I am calling you guys from my apartment in Brooklyn. And uh, I mostly work on these long-term 
social art projects with um, homeless shelters and transitional housing agencies. And so I've worked uh, across the US at different shelters um, for the past maybe seven years or so. So I'm really coming into this conversation as an art practitioner, but hopefully have some, um, some observations to offer. I'm going to start sharing my screen here so I can give you my presentation. Um, okay. And does it look like you can see this? Um, okay, great. I'm just going to play it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I want to first start by just setting um, setting up the context I'm working in because it's a very specific context, right? Working in these transitional housing agencies. Um, and I want to talk about how these shelter institutions that are meant to provide care often end up causing trauma to the clients and the staff who are part of that system. And then I'm gonna show just a, a few projects very, very briefly that propose how social art can start to change perceptions about what care could look like out, outside of a bottom line bureaucracy. Um, and I, I think we also think about um, caretaking in terms of maybe the physical or the emotional realm, but there's also this overlooked notion of economic care. And so working in these um, homeless shelters, the social workers really become these economic caregivers, um, but there are limitations to that uh, that I'll go into. Um, yes, so I should have showed that earlier. Uh, so, uh, one of the contexts I'm working in is because these spaces are for transitional housing, they often become almost a purgatory. Um, and in fact, part of the design of a homeless shelter is intentionally not to be too comfortable or too homey so that people don't want to stay too long. And, and this is even in the, the city oversight agency's handbook, you know, shelter is not meant to be a home. Um, and I really think that, I think that Part of this comes from these unspoken fears that if people can feel comfortable at a homeless shelter, well, then maybe the entire working class will be less, um, have less punitive incentive to continue having their labor be exploited and maybe capitalism could be at risk of being overthrown, right? So there's something to really be gained by keeping these spaces purposely underfunded and purposely uncomfortable. So those expectations of discomfort extend to staff as well. Um, I remember there was a few years ago, there was this big um, news article in the New York Post. It was like this expose that a shelter had spent $100 on these really comfortable ergonomic chairs for their staff. And it was kind of like, framing this as if it was um, they had misused their budget in doing so and i remember thinking well why is it wrong that a staff member would want to be comfortable at their jobs you know if google was paying this amount of money for a chair for their staff like we wouldn't bat an eye in fact that would be on the low end um, but i think it really comes down to this almost a moral imperative for discomfort as a show of the commitment of the caregiver. Um, and there is this idea that the less you care for yourself, the more care you will have to give to someone else, to your clients. Um, and of course, this scarcity model of care is really not sustainable. And it's also just not realistic. You know, it's not the nature of how care works. Every social worker knows this. They're, tr they're trained to know that they need to care for themselves first. But in fact, in reality, it's always the bottom last priority just because of these invisible, unspoken expectations and assumptions. Um, and also, you know, these are just disempowering. Um, the structure of these spaces are, is very disempowering uh, as well. The authority is structured top down. The frontline staff are voiceless and yet they're expected to give quality care within a system that doesn't 
care for them. Um, and many frontline staff are also making a poverty level wages, so they're in fact very close to homelessness themselves. Um, but I also want to talk about disempowerment in terms of this narrowing of identity. And, you know, part of our national identity as Americans, and this is also tied in with our economic system, is that, you know, we really love to have this freedom to express ourselves and the freedom to make choices about what we want. Um, and when you start to lose economic self-sufficiency, you also lose your rights to autonomy. Um, so you become, as a client in these spaces, you become a number in the system and almost as if you are the property of the state. And so there are some parallels to the prison system here as well. Um, but in an individualistic culture like America, it's, it's almost like the ultimate punishment is to lose your individuality or to lose your independence. And um, it really creates this identity crisis that could be avoidable. Um, so, you know, where can art come into spaces like this? Obviously, there's a lot to be critical about. Um, you know, my method personally is to have a care centered practice. So I'm really there to support the clients and the staff and um, and not just to agitate or criticize. And, and, you know, I'm thinking I'm talking about care as not just a one way paternalistic service, but I'm thinking of it as more of an ethics of equality. You know, care is a it's a tool to build connective networks and relationships toward that goal of equality. Um, and that's part of why I place care at the center of my practice. You know, it's not just to create like a feel good moment to just make homelessness temporarily more um, pleasant experience, but it's actually to use these relational methodologies to start to shift cultural value systems away from this idea that if you're poor, you don't deserve care or you don't deserve comfort. Um, so Beauty in Transition, this project you're looking at here, it's it's a um, salon on wheels that I converted a truck into a hair salon. And we visited um, homeless shelters in the Northeast, in, in New York and Pennsylvania, um, and provided, just offered free hair care for people who were living in, a, in the homeless shelter. So it's a pretty simple gesture. Um, and of course, a salon is a place for a, a type of superficial beauty, but it's also a social space. Um, and it functions as a way of breaking down these barriers, these, these social hierarchies that are keeping the lower classes stigmatized and ostracized. Um, so, you know, I could talk a lot about kind of the details about this project. It was running for three years on and off. Um, but I, you know, I want to keep this brief. So I'll just tell you one thing, you know, there was a one of our clients, a woman who came in and got her hair done. She had been homeless for quite a while. And she said the last time she had gone in to get her hair done, she went into a salon and paid full price. And she really felt like she was just treated like she was nothing. Um, all they did was they just barely wet down her hair. And usually, you know, at a salon, you'd get the whole like head massage, you'd get a, a hair wash, but they just patted her hair down with water and just cut her hair and quickly got her out of there. Um, and so it was almost like, um, even though she's paying full price, right? She's still treated as less than um, because she's homeless. So it was almost as if like lifting, temporarily lifting these rules of economic hierarchy, it also changed the social rules. Um, so the exchange inside of this project really became valued very differently when it was non-monetary. Um, my next project, it was really addressing the staff experience and trying to bring a spotlight on the staff's lack of care. So the project was really me just designing this workshop series that was using somatic physical methods to bring up these um, unspoken invisible topics that are part of their work and also to collectively process secondary trauma. Um, and so this project, you know, I did this for, um, uh, let's say I was working at this shelter for about a year. And then at the end of that year period, the staff then carried that workshop series forward. Um, 
And so part of my job as an artist was, okay, so I'm designing these workshops, you know, I'm figuring out what the curriculum is, I'm inviting workshop leaders in. Um, but then I feel like 80% of my job as an artist was just to convince the upper administrators um, at the shelter that these workshops should happen during the paid workday so that staff should be paid to process secondary trauma as a part of their work. And everybody wanted to have these workshops. Let, oh, let's do them on the weekend or let's do them after work hours so it's on the staff's own time. Um, that's typically how these things are offered. Uh, but I really wanted to reframe staff health as an institutional responsibility. Um, and then just finally, the last project I will mention, it's, it's a very new project. It, um, I released this in mid-March as coronavirus was really taking hold and becoming a big issue. Um, in, in, in different parts of the world, including Europe and the US and uh, in, the, in New York especially. Um, and so this is a, a web platform for exchanging help and care within zip codes. It's, the website is soszip.com, I'll share that later. Um, but really anyone with a zip code anywhere in the world can post a need that they have or post something that they have to help with that they can offer. So, you know, in my area, especially in, in Brooklyn, um, you know, I was noticing a really big uprising of these barter systems and mutual aid systems, but they were mostly staying inside social bubbles. And they were also just leaving out unhoused neighbors and, and people without these social support networks um, that they had access to. So, um, and there's also a lot of really great organizing that's happening on these corporately owned platforms like Facebook and Google, because really that's, you know, that's all we have. That's what we're used to using. Um, but of course, they're also monetizing our data. And if it's sensitive, vulnerable medical data, there, there's also a problem there. So I really wanted to just create a platform that was outside of those um, models. Uh, and also just this idea to spread this idea of lateral caregiving, which, which is like you can be in need and you can be offering help at the same time. You're not just one or the other. It's not just a charity model where you're either a helper or you're in need, you're needy. Um, so, you know, that's, in, in conclusion, I would just like to say, you know, I've, I've done some work inside institutions and I've done work, you know, outside more in the public and communities. And I keep coming back to the same question, you know, who is responsible for care? Who is responsible for dependency? And, you know, right now, all of the burden is on the social workers or the family members. And these are, these are both underfunded and ultra private spaces. So the rest of us don't have to feel responsible because it's not our job or it's like not our family member. Um, but I really want to continue, you know, playing with this idea that, care can be a visible um, and more of a public responsibility. Not so that the state is just off the hook, like they don't need to fund it, but as a way to make care a public concern so that in hopes that this can lead to more advocacy for state support. Um, so that is all I have here. And I will um, stop sharing my screen and give it back to you guys. Okay, thanks a lot for sharing your projects and inspirations with us. Um, we were supposed to have two more speakers, as I had mentioned already earlier, so I'm gonna do another check if either one of them uh, is already, uh, has already joined uh, meanwhile. So let me first check um, if Mladen already joined. I don't immediately see a profile that corresponds to that name, so. I'm afraid not. So I will just for the moment, for the time being, give my own take then on this contribution. Um, when I read the abstract, it said uncertainty principle. And it was a two page abstract. And to be honest, I was somewhat uncertain on what it would be, would have been about. So I think now it has proven to be even uncertain that the contribution is even there. So let's say that it's 
at least it's consistent. Um, so then maybe the let's give it another try with our final speakers then. Bamidele Awoyemi, Jason Liu, Senchia, is any of them here? Afraid not. Yeah, let me first apologize for, for them being absent because I, I think maybe you together with me were really looking forward to these contributions and I, I can make a little bit of a joke out of it. But um, also this final contribution, let me give my own take on that. So I think um, the, as, as we're observing uh, the market, at least the way I, I observe it, um, for example, we are here in Eindhoven, which is the city of Philips Electronics. And uh, until a few decades ago, Philips was making razors, TV uh, sets, and light bulbs, if you want. But then suddenly they stopped selling products. If you now buy something from Philips, you usually you don't buy a product anymore, but you buy a service, right? You buy light as a service, for example. And I see this everywhere. You have software as a service, you have mobility as a service. So everything turns into a service. And the speakers that, that are not here, the title of their talk was I'd rather own nothing. And, and they were going to present us life as a service where you could outsource your entire life to a company that would provide it as a service to you. And then my little uh, take on it is that maybe they found a company to provide them life as a service, but they forgot to service them into this conference. So um, I'm sorry for missing out on two, um, no doubt, interesting lectures, uh, but we'll, we'll just move into the uh, Q&A. And I see here in the chat um, already a question from James uh, to Jody and maybe, James, you can just uh, rephrase it in your own words if you want, so that it's uh, clear from the beginning what the question is, and uh, we'll start with that. Sure. I, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks very much. But um, I was just, I mean, I'm in the UK, and it feels like um, the media here sort of promotes this kind of very negative notion of the kind of deserving and undeserving poor, uh, which feels, you know, positively kind of Victorian at times, really. And... Um, that's got to have an impact on, you know, on, on us all. So I just wondered what you felt might be done quickly if there was something that we could all do fast to kind of change that notion of the deserving and undeserving poor. Yeah, well, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, because, um, you know, for once, like President Trump is saying, oh, all these people lost their jobs and it's not their fault. It's, it's not your fault that you're in this state, that you don't know what to do, that you're in this state of economic precarity. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, you never hear this from Trump, right? Um, he's always placing the blame on, on marginalized groups. And I think it really has to do with who right now, who is actually suffering and a lot of it is his voter contingency and a lot of it is like white people right like so how many people of color are like um you know becoming homeless or becoming evicted every every day um and they are going unnoticed too in these systems so i mean this idea of of who's deserving and who's undeserving. For me, I mean, I keep thinking when, when I hear this, oh, it's nobody's fault right now. Uh, it's very interesting because it's almost like with uh, this pandemic um, and also with our 2008 housing crash, the same thing happened. I remember there was a lot more empathy for people who were homeless because it was like, oh wow, people are really like losing their houses and it's not their fault. You know, it's the system. Um, so I would say just like, I, I love the idea of framing an in individual suffering. We're all living in society, right? So an individual suffering is part of our collective responsibility. And I guess I will just say, you know, um, I don't know if there's an, an easy just like solution that everybody could be doing right now. I think it's a mental shift in a way and it comes from our, you know, authority or who's, you know, who's like governing our state as well. That's very powerful. Um, but I would also just say um, that because 
I believe in this kind of radical kinship that we're all part of society. And so one person's problems is, is everybody's problems, um, that you can really engage with people who are maybe outside of your social network or like outside of your um, kind of kinship group um, and, and not to feel like, okay, everybody just needs to stay in their lane. I don't know what I'm doing because this person is um, outside of my experience. I mean, I don't know if that's at all helpful, but I, you know, I have the same question, honestly. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, I mean, my friend Mark was just commenting that, um, you know, in the UK, we've got this sort of notion of that, like the Conservative Party brought in this notion of a big society, um, which was meant to be a sort of way for the, the kind of third sector to fill the gaps between, you know, public and private. And it's not it's not really worked, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, if I can just make a book recommendation that has to do everything you're saying um, and it's sitting right next to me because it's my Bible. Uh, it's The Autonomy Myth by Martha Feynman. So she's a legal scholar. She um, is really looking at this um, kind of idea of the deserving or undeserving poor, the role of NGOs, the role of the state. She's looking at that from a legal jurisprudence standpoint and I mean, it's it's amazing. She okay, like one of her ideas is really just that dependency is a is just an inevitable human condition, and so we need to like have more acceptance for dependency and stop championing this idea of self sufficiency and independence. Mm -hmm. So one of my other projects is I actually have a a online. Um, service where I treat Americans for toxic levels of independence. So it's like treating independence as if it's this like toxic like virus because it really is right it separates us keeps us isolated um, and then like trying to integrate dependency in our lives as a positive. Yeah it's like the difference between neediness and need isn't it? It's um you know, we all yeah. have we all have needs. We all have needs, but it's a privilege to think of ourselves as not being needy. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, then Joseph has also been active uh, with two questions. Maybe the first one for Attila. And Joseph, since you're here, I, I will have you just uh, rephrase your question if you want. Um, if you're there. I'm here to rephrase my question. So, uh, no, I want to thank Attila for the wonderful contribution. Uh, my question basically was, okay, it is a kind of set of tools, yeah, design tools, how to kind of foster collaboration. So my question was pointing in the direction, um, how do you make sure these tools are used for good and not otherwise? Uh, it's a good question. And I, I don't have a specific answer to that. Um, like what we, we have seen and, and like uh, now we see the propaganda happening in Hungary, but also in my countries, it's very, you can use media and the internet really in, in various ways. So I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a good answer. I think transparency is, is, is part of it. So if you, and which, which is, true for advertising and, and politics and journalism and everything if you are honest and transparent about your uh, about your motivations and your your course of action that that's something that uh, could help but then we have even if if everything is transparent we still have the the the, the fake news and this kind of creation of noise so that you even start to uh, or stop believing the, the truth and, and the facts because of the rest of the noise so I, this is this is my only, only response maybe someone else has a better answer i don't know <laughs> okay yeah sorry well, thanks thank we just uh yeah um and then i think in a straightforward question to uh vegas um it's all about the money, right? What was the price of the most expensive artwork you ever sold? If, well, if Vegas is still there. 
I think he also. Oh, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. So I'm sorry. We we will not find out. Um, then indeed, there's a question from Alexis about the abstract. Um, yeah, so the abstract on disturbance in fine art. To be honest, that's the one that had the title of uncertainty principle. So uh, I'm not sure uh, from what the way I've scanned through it uh, in my preparation for this conference, I'm afraid I won't be able to now on the spot comment a little bit more, but um, we're discussing with Balpan if uh, part of this abstract or the entire abstract can be shared uh, with you. So uh, uh, Alexis, make sure to leave your contact details uh, with Balpan uh, if they don't have it already and uh, we'll see if we can uh, give you a little bit more insight into the content, contents of these one or two talks that weren't here uh, this afternoon. So um, I think also I, I still have a, a question to, uh, first of all, to Attila. Um, you mentioned indeed starting with the business model canvas and I'm, I'm obviously familiar with that. And what I usually see is that um, these kind of tools we always pitch them to other people as being very useful. And I, I was also wondering uh, your own um, uh, social uh, entrepreneurship, like social business tool, um, if you, you've you probably or, or most likely filled it out for your own project. And I was just curious about your own personal balance between contribution and reward. Uh, can you give us a little see through uh, what it looks like? I think uh, yes. Um, it's a good, good, good question. So um, I think the, first of all, these tools are useful if they either have visualizing, and the second one is if they if they help you facilitate a conversation. So the, with business model canvas, my experience is like like it's often pitched to entrepreneurship to students and young startups that like this is the one, fill it, and you are done. And no, you are not done. This is a way. This is a it's a tool to visualize and help, like like give a frame to your thinking, but it doesn't mean that if you fill it out, your your it will work. It you will you will succeed. Uh, on the social design and commerce, I can give you uh, two examples. One when we did the workshops and when, um, when and then one of the participants was she's doing like a um, kind of a social enterprise. She's using refurbished fabrics and create uh, like bags and uh, uh, clothes from this uh, secondhand fabric. And we kind of uh, were looking at ways for her to kind of better uh, reach out to potential like people who donate the fabric and then also like then better market her, her, her project, I would say, or services. And uh, the world effect, so it can happen that if you incentivize people with money, then they will actually be less motivated. So this is the tricky part and how you can manage it like at your work within or within the company or at your like how you divide yourself between doing stuff for for the living and doing stuff for else and how we can institutionalize this kind of practices which i i don't know but there should be ways to do it um that's something that i think should be interesting i, I would like to explore Okay, thanks a lot. And and I think also what I take away from from your uh, tool is that in a way it makes me remind some of my mother's wisdom always said like you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And I think that that's also something that is triggered by your tool to really understand like why would this person invest in this uh, in this initiative. So thanks a lot. And then Jody, your uh, talk also triggered uh, a thought with me, which has to do with, uh, um, and I just want to check if this is also resonates with you, but that for me, there's this interesting balance of, let's say, your own uh, quality and standard of living versus the quality and standard of living of the people you're helping. And, and in a way that sometimes almost feels as if you have to apologize that you live in a ditched, a detached house while you're helping the homeless, and then maybe should you move to a semi-detached house? And but you then also have to apologize. So, so this kind of dilemma always between your own context and the context of the people that you're helping that that kind of triggered me in your talk as well. Is that something that that also resonates with you? That you also encounter in your personal dilemmas, if you want. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I don't feel like guilt is really a productive, you know, necessarily place to sit in, you know? And so I, if I'm really engaging with people, it's about being transparent too. Um, and yeah, I have, I have an apartment, but I also have a lot of housing instability myself. Um, you know, I live in New York where the rent could go up $600 tomorrow, you know, and it's happened before many times. So I've probably had like, um, you know, 10 apartments in, ten, in as many years. So I think that that a uh, state of like, you know, that it doesn't mean that I know what it's like to be homeless. I, I don't at all. And I've never lived in a shelter. And so I think that part of like engaging with worlds that are outside of your own world is that kind of honesty about the limits of empathy. I don't, I don't think guilt is like healthy, but I also don't think pretending to empathize with a situation you don't feel personally is also healthy, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I come in with a certain amount of privilege, a lot of privilege relative to who I'm working with. And there is a way that I have to ethically engage with that privilege and also use it to create space for other leaders to come forward, right? Or to create these non-hierarchical experiences and to also leverage art funding for funding that's actually going into poverty support. Um, you know, and I could go, go into all of those kinds of ways that I deal with that, but I mean, but that's definitely, yeah, that's, that's an issue yeah, with any maybe, artist. I think, I think maybe unintentionally I triggered something that I actually wanted to maybe oppose to a little bit is, and, and maybe I, I phrased my question in the wrong way, but I certainly did not want you to justify yourself or whatever just how do you i sometimes get the feeling that this is the way you're being looked upon by society if you want right whereas yeah. for, your, for yourself you've got it right there like okay this is right what i'm doing i shouldn't be apologizing <laughs> for my own situation but sometimes i feel that that the way people look yeah. at what you said people way people look at the less fortunate and they say okay even if you pay to the extent that even if you pay the full amount you don't get the same service then in a way there's yeah. also this this like okay you you have to be um yeah you have to be uncomfortable yourself as you said huh? you have to be uncomfortable yourself if you're an ngo yeah. you cannot have a decent uh, office chair apparently so right was, right 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 like, yeah, yeah right no it's it's really like a, a weird kind of tension and or it's not really weird. It's it's just like a natural tension that comes up with like these, you know, different worlds colliding in a way. And I don't think that that tension, I mean, I think that tension is actually very interesting too. Like what is the artist's role? Like what does an artist with privilege do with, um, you know, people who are in the shelter, do, do I just stay in my world and not engage with that? Or do I f try to find a way to kind of like navigate that privilege? Um, but it's definitely like, yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it's, it's like the way that I think it's problematic too, like, um, especially just these days where we're feeling so divided in, in the U.S. especially, you know, I think it's, it's safer if you're staying in your own lane or just talking to people who look like you and, and ha are in your same socioeconomic status. It's just safer. Um, but I... So yes, I think what I'm doing is it has some problems to it, right? It's kind of problematic in a way. But I also think that I think that that's a better than the alternative in a way. I yeah, guess. I fully agree. I think it's in a very nice way. It's problematic. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think we're we're more or less uh, coming towards the wrap up of this. Wait, can uh, I? Session? Yeah, sure. Can I just tell Attila that I really loved your tool a lot and I feel like I, I really want to use this because I find myself oftentimes um, starting a project or like be, being like the author in a way of a collaborative project that is intended to pass hands, right? Like especially choreographing care. I was trying to build up this project and the project ethics and then pass it on to the staff leadership to take it over after I leave. Um, 
And there, they did, they, they took it over for a while, they led workshops, they brought in other people, but then eventually, like eight months later, it collapsed because they felt like they didn't have what um, their job duties taken off of their plate so that they could really devote time to like just leading another project, even if it was for their own health and even if it, it created the space for them that they didn't have. Um, and so I wonder about this idea of like using this for artists who are transitioning a project or like whatever kind of a leader that's transitioning a project into the community. I think there's tons of examples of artists doing this like Tanya Bruguera with Immigrant Movement International. Um, and I don't know if artists have been using it this way or how you're in, intending it to be used, or, but I feel like it could have that purpose for me at least. Uh, definitely, and I think that the very good point is kind of figuring out like who are the who who the stakeholders or the participants are in the process, and like what's what's their motivation it is. Because if if there is like this is what is often missing, like like artists, uh, community people, like creating all these kind of social community projects, uh, but having them involved, they don't re recognize that the they they, they 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 come in and they they organize and they set up and motivate people and you know convince people to do stuff yeah. but they don't recognize their own fuel to the system so like yes it's because they do the 50 percent of the project and if you step out that's like obvious that it will fall apart and what what the and there is one one, one in, in this research less in the in the in, well, like less so much in the in the canvas, but in the research that we have, when we analyze all these social uh, projects, one thing that we realize that, and this is also a one way that these projects are very different from businesses, is that you cannot push uh, acceptance. So this is the like you cannot ex, uh, expand to the market. So like if you are Airbnb or Uber, if you have enough capital and you have USA. And you have enough capital you will expand to other markets and you know go to the europe and go to other countries because you are you have the capital and you you, you see the benefit so that it makes sense whereas this the social projects usually how they how they happen they have there is like a pull mechanism that i, I would describe as a pull uh, uh instead of push so like critical mass uh, started first time in in uh, san francisco and then some people in poland said like, oh, this is a nice thing uh, and we should, we should adopt and do it in Poland. Um, it was, I think it was in Gdansk, I can't remember exactly um, which city. And they, those people who approached the San Francisco guys, like, can we do the same in, 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 in Gdansk? They, and of course they said, yeah, why not? Uh, they, uh, the people in Poland, they were already kind of playing that role that they wanted to invest their parts. So this is something like you cannot really convince like you can find people but you cannot push them you cannot pay them you cannot ask them to do it they have to get motivated first so they have to get excited first and then they can pull and this this is kind of the the tricky part because you can you can work towards making it more appealing you can document your way of working and you can think about and this is where the canvas is useful kind of to what could be the potential motivation for participants, but at the end of the day, you cannot push them because you cannot hire them. Like, and the, if it, you hire them, that's a very different situation again. So, so basically, you have to find help people. You can help them to find their motivations, but they have to find it. Yeah, interesting. There is um, some of like the, uh, one of the interviews is that the founder of Pachi uh, explained it in, in the in the book and we have it in, in like like it always starts with the local people who get excited and then they can pull pull the project um, and I think that's very true. Right, because you want it to have like I guess the high motivation, the high payoff with the without having it take just tireless effort too, right? Because who's going to engage with a project that is requiring all this effort and the payoff isn't equaling that. So it's like, it has to be more somehow, somehow the payoff has to be more than the effort put in. So you have to design these systems exactly. that, that do that. That's yeah, really the, the tricky. It's about the balance. It's about yeah. the balance. 
and yeah, yeah. and and th there are, there are ways to to solve this like uh, like um, some meetup organizers they do shifts so that they don't have to work so much so they have uh, a month, uh, uh. even every month but there are four of them and they take uh, like a rotate so one month you're responsible to to uh, recruiting the speakers and making sure everything is looking good on the slides which is a lot more work than the other guy is just today i'm the video guy i'm just recording my only job is to drink beer and hold the camera and that's the, <laughs> that, that is, that, that's the easier job um, um and, and one more thing and this is something again further to explore that my experience is because i used to be a member of the student union at the, at the university. I'm a very social guy. And I remember we organized so many social and cultural and sports events. And I remember like that like 10% of the people are like this kind of active people. Maybe 20% of the people will, if you really push them, they will participate. And then the like 70% of the people, even if you make the best party ever and free and everything, they will not just don't care. And this is something you have to understand that there are people who kind of enjoy doing this and you are probably also one of them and it gives you that value which is not necessarily uh, like you cannot really uh, translate to numbers or money but still you enjoy it like me i organize organizing social events i enjoy so that gives value to me but but this still my contribution is very important and if you unless you don't find such people who would get the same benefit because they're this kind of social social people it, you might not uh, keep it sustainable or successful, so. Mm, right, right. Thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah. I hope I'm not interrupting too much in this uh, lively uh, dialogue, but uh, <laughs> as you might have seen in the chat, meanwhile, one of the missing speakers from earlier on has joined us. Um, so uh, welcome, Bamidele. And if you're up for it, I would be more than happy to give you the screen and the microphone and uh, to, to enlighten us about your initiative, the Life Subscription Agency. And uh, I think that the title of your abstract at least was I'd Rather Own Nothing. So um, I welcome you to share your uh, camera and screen and to unmute yourself and, uh, and, and give us your 10 minutes of, uh, of insights. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, massive apologies to everybody. Um, yeah, I made basically a massive error about C CET time and G GMT time. So I'm an hour late. Sorry about that. Um, so I will go quite quickly through this presentation. So not to keep everyone. So, let me start. So, this is um, brought to you by the Life Subscription Agency, which is us. I'm one of three members of this fictional company that we sort of made up looking at on all subscription about our relationship with ownership and subscription. And our, one of our taglines is I'd rather own nothing. So it's so in terms of the life subscription agency or our sort of research, how it sort of started off with us looking into our obsession with things and objects, phones, iPods, Playstations, some of these which we don't use anymore because they're all stuck to our iPhones. But um, what we did was to look at, um, to really like unpack why, what is this obsession with ownership that we have and how has it changed over time with things like um so we're based in the uk and london um so things like santander bikes so shared bike schemes um things like cutlery that come in packs of six even though you use one there's a lot of i guess it's quite now with like extinction rebellion and a lot of talk about the economy and about about um about the environment, we were very interested, we were really interested about this thing about why do we use so much and do we need to use so much? And this whole relationship between if we have a pack of six forks, but we only use one fork, why do we need six forks? Or if you have a screwdriver and you only use it for one, for like two days in 
three years, then why do you own the screwdriver? What's, where's the value in that? And these images were sort of our sort of like initial sort of breakdown into, well, actually, in a way, it's just a waste. Like we're using, we, we, we have such an onus on owning all these things, but actually, do we really need to? And could that change? And initially, like what started to happen with trends of like with clothing, um, with subscriptions, with Netflix, is that we went from this sort of stage of like owning everything to partly owning everything or renting things. And then we sort of said, what if you take this a bit further? What could happen next? And what of a person who owns nothing? Um, and I hope the sound plays on this. So let me know if it's not playing. Can you hear that? No, we don't hear the sound. When you share yeah. your screen, there's a checkbox that you can share your computer audio. I think you have to make sure to uh, select that. Oh, I think I just selected it. Um, that. So in short, the life subscription agency, oh, sorry again. The life subscription agency is an all subscription non-ownership company that we sort of bought up or used as a tool of speculation to start conversations and to start really unpacking if we if you couldn't we took this to the extreme. So we said if a person couldn't own anything at all what would the world look like and how would the world change? How would the economy change to suit this? And the life subscription agency was a sort of company that came up about, did something happen? Can everyone still hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, that sort of came up as about this sort of life subscription um, agents, this, this agency came up as a sort of route that would allow people to basically own nothing. And the life subscription agency would add to this company, which in terms of, I don't know, film, but not also, not just film and clothing, it would also be, what would it be like if actually your home was completely under this package and you could go to another home in a completely different place, a workplace. So it's almost like ramping up all these little things that have started already happening with like co-working spaces and basically taking it to, to the next extreme where everything apart from your own body can be part of the subscription lifestyle and, and stuff. And hence, as you sort of see there. So what we sort of did as part of the speculation was to sort of say, was to use net models. Um, and if you're familiar with Netflix, you've probably seen can tell from some of the references here we sort of used it as a sort of model to sort of play out this sort of how this company would first begin by offering by sort of like to get people to get into this habit of like giving away their lives or giving having a non-ownership lifestyle would start from a basic subscription which would be similar to what we sort of have today and you would also and you slide down this scale with the hope that everyone would end up in this last bracket of all in. And then this is just sort of reiterating um, this honeycomb diagram of all the sort of services or things that the life subscription agency would encompass. So municipal space, mobility, money, health, wellness. And yeah, it was just sort of like an experiment to again tease out what sort of sectors this would sort of fall into. And as we sort of carried on going with how the life subscription agency would operate, it would be like, initially we were talking about, it would be through apps. 
so if this if this agency just came about how could we take advantage of tools that we already have in the world now so an, an app is obviously a very obvious one talking about the nearest share point to take to take an object, another object and share with another person and for us it was always about by sharing we were we were trying to say through the company how could Now we lost you, uh, I think. Okay, waiting to see if this technical glitch gets resolved. Raise your hand if I am the only one who is not hearing Bami Dele anymore. Okay, nobody does. I can't hear Bami either. No, no, and now he's gone. So, uh, okay, it's a bit unfortunate. Let's say we wait uh, just a minute. Yeah, here he is again. So let's hope he can reconnect. Yeah, Bami Dele, we lost you for a moment. So, oh, yeah, don't worry. All right. Yeah, now it's better. So maybe you can just recap from a minute or so again where you where we lost you. If you're there. No. No, again. Okay, we'll just wait, give it one other try. Let's hope it works. At least we've, you know. Okay, I'm back again. Yes, let's give it one more try. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm really sorry about this. See my screen? Can you hear me? Okay, let's go. Um, I was talking about, um, we sort of like took this company that we sort of made up and it how you're sort of looking through our speculation of how it would start to enter this sort of world was through apps um sort of like dictating where you share and where you meet up and share with people but then we started asking how can you share better and rather than just actually just sharing indiscriminately is there a way of controlling that and limiting it so that actually becomes a lot more rich and a lot and a lot more valuable rather than having a situation where you have like again for our case was like the sort of like dockless bikes that sort of like get left all over the place and actually not all of them are being used at the same time so we were talking about this constant cycle and this image again was sort of our play on like coding all the objects that exist and also in a way giving them an object passport so it was the idea that by creating a circulation system or a passport system it would mean that it when there would be it would to limit the amount of time that an object was not in use. So that would always be in use because it would be constantly passed on in this sort of like endless cycle. And then this was like part of the speculation as well is just like the first established life subscription agency would pop up in like your local news agents or something and it would start to take over these sort of shops where you could come in for your free life subscription agency consultations and stuff. And then this was sort of like again really elaborating on this that what could happen in the world does it start to work in this way that would the rest of the world just start taking on similar sort of packages or would they start to like adopt this sort of method of subscription and how would the world sort of like what parts of the world would start to really um be get on board straight away with 
this sort of non-ownership lifestyle and and we had like lots of conversations with people as well and through this map it was another conversation point because for us it was very interesting to see how the concept of ownership in like western environments is quite different from in like other like so for my from my sort of background being nigerian so west african that diaspora ownership is a very big thing and it's and the idea of renting is not is not really feasible at all so it was so again it was another sort of thing as we through our research that we sort of trying to make these moments of like maps and diagrams and stuff to really like tease out this relationship between ownership and subscription and then these were just like initial sort of like um thing things that would happen within the world that would start to come up as the life subscription agency being trying to make its mark on the world would they start to create share points would they create their own bus stops and create this their own physical layer or language in the city through benches cones all sorts share boxes plaques pavement and then at the and then one of the things we created was this handbook to sort of like consolidate all our ideas which was the handbook for the person who owns nothing which sort of like elaborated on some of these ideas or the the manifesto for the life subscription agency um just again saying that oh if a car owns itself do you, and cars are in constant use does that mean car parks can be used for something else if the home is no longer if the home is no longer if you don't own anything in the home does that open up more space and does the way we build or partitions and things like that start changing um so our background was in architecture so the, these were like a few starting points for us to sort of like start pulling off into that and then yeah and also just to again us being a bit playful as well through the speculation is like creating these things like contracts um i be on the practitioner and really making these documents that would this be what would happen in this sort of like non non ownership or subscription world and then yeah i sort of rushed really quickly through it because i don't want to keep the time because i was late but um yeah the what next for us was sort of like as we sort of did this handbook and these conversations kept happening it was to do a second version of this handbook and to be actually like to really like unpack how a non subscription or this life subscription agency would would work when it actually happen when it's actually put into actual things that are happening especially where we are so for example here in london we have the london plan which is a document which unpacks how like the next 5 years or 6 years of how they'll develop different areas and stuff like that and what we want to do is maybe like take that and then do our own version of that to then start really criti critically analyzing how these sort of things um how non subscription could actually work in these sort of settings so that there's something to test against it but i'm going to stop talking now and thanks for listening and sorry that i was late again but yeah no thanks a lot apologies uh, <laughs> taken it's it's no problem um maybe first uh, looking at the the chat window um is there any way to get hold of of the the manual that you showed is it is it somewhere available or can it be uh, purchased or whatever um well we well it lives like with us at the moment it was at the oslo triennale there was like 10 versions of it but we probably will upload it to our website um which is the life subscription dot agency i'll type it in we're planning to up, do a bit of a revamp to that with some new stuff but that should that has like some of the speculations that we've had before but it will will also yeah. put like the book up there as a pdf version that people can sort of like see the yeah. version 1 manifesto okay great thanks a lot for sharing and then um i actually looking at jody's question i i think i had more or less the same question uh going back to the map that you showed uh yeah. representing uh i think the the attitudes of cultures towards ownership uh as as maybe representing the 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 possibilities of them um 
let's say, um, embracing your concept. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that map? Like, what does it represent? How, how did it came about? How did you analyze the data? Well, I think for us, um, it was a lot of, I'll go to map just so that, yeah. For us, it was a lot of, it was a lot of like gathering research and trying to see of where we found a lot of these articles about the sharing economy. And most of the time, but this might also be because we obviously were educated in, in Western, we're here. And we were also, and also like a lot of the topics that are being spoken about sharing, the sharing economy are from the West. So for, so for us, it was very much, this map was almost like, was almost us trying to, I'm trying to find a, an, the right way to say it. It's almost like we, we created this map as a way to tease this conversation out because we thought it was quite weird that, or not weird, it was quite interesting that a lot of the West was like, okay, Airbnb, these are like some of their like, spots that they do this uber like are really prevalent in these areas are used a lot and so a lot of these sharing sort of economies happen in these areas and actually they do also happen everywhere else don't get me don't get me wrong but they're more they have more of a presence in in these areas which we were sort of like implying does this suggest that people are less likely to want to share in these areas and then from like so we so zen and Zen and um, Jason, who are the other two of the Life Subscription Agency, they're Chinese. Um, so they're, in their sort of cultures, this is quite big already. This is happening, like this sort of sharing economy. Whereas in me being from a Nigerian background, it's very much me having, having this conversation with my parents or with family back home. It was very much a thing of why would I want my home to be shared by someone else it's very much you own the land and you live on the land you live off of the land and I think it's it might that might have also come about because there's still like agricultural sort of influences so you still use the land you can still live off of the land whereas here like for example in London like you even though you live here you still need other things to actually survive is the sort of thing I don't know if that sort of answers your question or elaborates a bit more on how we... Jody, is that uh, answering your question? Okay, great, thumbs up. Okay, then, um, thanks again uh, to all the speakers for having shared their, their insight. Also, uh, please check the uh, chat window because there are also a lot of other uh, valuable suggestions are being shared. So I think uh, it's really, nice to see this uh, engagement um, then um, let's see we kind of come to the end of this first day of the conference and um, i want to leave you with um, first of all some practicalities and second of all uh, something else which i'll explain so tomorrow morning uh, at 10 o'clock central european time we will start again with a session on redesigning infrastructures. And then at 12.30 CET, we will have a session on nature's economies. So I hope that a lot of you will be able to join tomorrow uh, as well. And then um, for those of you who were not there this morning, um, this, this entire conference is obviously part of a very, of a bigger festival that uh, has been going on for a few months with uh, lectures and presentations at uh, given moments in time and it will go on for the coming uh, two months I think one or two months and um, uh, since I was asked by Baltan to report a little bit on, on the trajectory and the insights that are behind this uh, uh, festival and the laboratory that's behind it uh, this morning I showed a small compilation movie which features some of the things that stayed with me from uh, viewing the previous uh, lectures. So uh, for those of you who have not seen it yet, I think I, I will uh, share it and then we, we will close the room after the video is uh, finished. And I hope it inspires you to have a look 
at the Economia Festival YouTube channel where all these uh, lectures can be uh, fully, fully presented. And now just one moment because someone is waving at yeah. And of course, don't forget after or, or on top of the sessions, the conference sessions tomorrow, also tomorrow evening at five o'clock, there will be a keynote by Michelle Bowers, which you can also watch online with a live Q&A afterwards. So if you're interested in that, make sure to obtain the details from Baltan. So leaves me to thank all of you. I hope some of you still have their cameras on. My energy level went up and my inspiration as well. So I hope you enjoyed your time. I'm going to leave you with the compilation video and hope to see uh, all of you again, if not tomorrow, then on any other occasion. So thanks a lot and uh, have an inspiring day. One moment, how do I share this? Oh, this is gone. Here I am. Let me do this. Here. Okay. Before the coin lands, you know what to do. It is not so much that the coin will give you the answer, it will make you answer by pretending to answer for you. As if the solution to uncertainty is not certainty, but bluff. And she said to me, are you ready? I said, yeah, I think so. Don't know for what I had to be ready, but I know if someone in Africa asks you that, you say, yes, I'm ready. And she walked with me into the bush and we walked and then we entered the cave and we went deep into the cave. It was pitch dark in the cave. I don't know how long I've been there. An hour, two hours, 10 minutes, half a day. No idea. Mama Gera came and got me. And she saw me and she said, now you're ready. The word growth is rooted in the Proto-Germanic word Gru, which means something like the land becoming green again in the beginning of spring. By giving a word to this specific moment in time and then extracting it from that particular context and time frame, as alphabet based languages tend to do, its meaning and our intimate understanding of it mutated and was corrupted. Gru originally takes place in relation to what went before and what will come after. What is telling us the way we are behaving with money? is telling us that we believe that in the future there's going to be a highly successful, vibrant economy, highly productive, highly wealthy, which is able to pay down that debt. And my central point is that it's not going to happen. Trust has a soulmate. She's called money and will be our guide. Um, so here's an example uh, that we worked with L'Oreal at uh, one of their headquarters here in the Netherlands has around 250 uh, staff in it. In the end of the first month, we had 75% of the staff actually sign up and use it. They carried out 4,000 actions in one month, and that equates or created a CO2 reduction of 8,000 kilograms, which is more than 60 flights from Amsterdam to Paris. Trust me, I got this. Now well beyond the control of a single man, yet for a moment supported by the breeze, it hovers around his head like a paper cloud. For a moment, he is a sorcerer, a wizard, the abstract promise of something truly magical. The ever-expanding newspaper somehow representing the ever-expanding reach of humanity. But in fact, this promise of abundance is central to all our most important religious texts. From the land of milk and honey in the Torah, to al Qatar in the Quran, or Jesus turning water into wine in the Bible. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. 96% of all the life on the planet has uh, perished. And that came about uh, also uh, uh, due to massive amount of CO2 released, either due to a volcanic uh, eruption or an asteroid impact leading to global warming, uh, changing ocean currents, ocean acidification, and you had the collapse of ecosystems. Uh, and uh, the sixth extension that we are into right now, we can see species are already disappearing at more than 1,000 times the background rate. 
And we have, this is the first extinction event that is not caused by a geological or an astrological uh, uh, impact event, but is caused solely by the activities of one species, and that being us human beings. Trust me, you got this. We need that bridge to heal the world. And your work is to build that bridge, that bridge between science and the indigenous, between economics and the social, between culture and nature, because all of that is one, and we tend to forget that. There's a number of books that claim that uh, the human history of ingesting these entheogens and, 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 and uh, psychedelic substances is basically what led to the evolution of a spiritual center in the brain where we feel connected with nature and it's quite a common uh, effect that even if you ingest minute quantities that will not put you on a high of some of these substances you will just feel much more connected to everything around us but in our western societies we've actually uh, we favor productivity, and for productivity, we want to have absolutely predictable, as, as much as possible predictable behavior. So we've actually legislated against a lot of these substances, and we've taken them out of our natural diet, which means actually you can argue that maybe we are programming humanity for rational existence. If we need to change the system, and we do, then we can grow the new system. But at the same time, we have to stand our ground and say no to things that are happening in the current system. Exploiting people, exploiting nature, we have to say no. I'm not asking governments to embrace post-capitalism. I am asking for them to think as they take anti-crisis measures about using those anti-crisis measures as a long-term play into a new kind of economy. Trust me, we got this. Okay, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you later. We're here. Okay, hello everyone. The, just to check, do you hear me well? Uh, so my name is Mladen Bundalo. I'm an artist, visual artist, uh, interdisciplinary artist. I live in Brussels and uh, I thought I have something to share with you uh, as I had uh, experience with economy, personal experience of economy uh, from which was an uncertain experience and it was experience of hyperinflation which happened in the 90s in Yugoslavia and from other side um, uh, uncertainty today is really kind of a feeling that emerged uh, as you know, last uh, from actually all this year, uh, there is a big, uh, uh, big, big focus on uncertainty, as it uh, it was brought uh, with uh, the the coronavirus crisis. And uh, it's interesting to see what happening uh, during the during uncertainties uh, in all fields of uh, of human activities and economy uh, is uh, is certainly one of one of them. And also, it's interesting to see how how art uh, can be a vehicle or an optics uh, through which we can actually understand what is uh, what this uh, uncertainty uh, can can actually can can be and cannot be. 
and I will go quickly. Ten minutes is really short uh, time frame. Time frame. So we dive dive directly into some of my works, and I'm going to share screen with you. Okay. So bank bank banknotes are one of one of visual elements, let's say, of of of, of a state of a go government which are at the same time a piece of uh, art and uh, banknotes are often signed by you. Uh, they, they contain also the sign of, of author of the banknote. Uh, I mean, at least they were used to be, uh, just to see if I can. And he, here we can, uh, the, in Yugoslavia we use a dinar, uh, it, was a, it, uh, it was a currency. Uh, and here we have the dinar banknote uh, uh, which was published in late uh, 80s and it was a g banknote of a girl a girl an how to say uh, anonymous girl as the yugoslav communist um, uh, state was uh, was about to communicate universal values uh, not a personal uh, achievements that much so it was just a girl and from the back side uh, of the banknote uh, we could find some uh, some equations, uh, some some letters which should evoke uh, education, progress, uh, youth of the nation, and so on. And uh, here we have four editions of the of girl banknotes. Uh, the first one was starting about the short period of hyperinflation uh, in uh, 1989 during two, two years, uh, two, two months, and then they uh, devaluate uh, the banknote to 10. And uh, then at the beginning of uh, 90s, uh, with culmination of war, uh, we had a complete uh, economic collapse. And the period of hyperinflation started officially in, in February 1992, and it lasted around two years. And during these two years, the dinar banknote um, uh, published 32, 33, I think, new, uh, new, new banknotes, and which is absolutely unusual for, for a banknote uh, to be republished uh, so many times in two years. And what we have witnessed uh, is actually that cultural, uh, cultural shift uh, on the banknote itself. Um, just to finish with this, what is interesting on this banknote is that uh, uh, the, the central shape uh, behind the, the value, uh, which was a, about uh, some sunflower sun shape, has, has some evolution in its uh, visual representation. And uh, it end up uh, with a, it end up with a kind of distorted, uh, uh, distorted sun uh, shape with a lot of disturbances and uh, and it kind of uh, subliminally evoke what is going on the, behind. Also, they were changing the colors and uh, just playing around. Uh, also, what is interesting, you see the first top two banknotes, they, they hold the emblem of uh, Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia, Federal Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. And down two banknotes, they just have a uh, emblem of a new state. Uh, so that was reduced to Yugos second Yugoslavia, which was reduced to Serbia and Montenegro. Okay. So this is the final edition of the, of the girl banknote and it, uh, it valued uh, 100, uh, no, one, 1 billion of dinars. Uh, the dinar banknote has lost uh, its value, I think 3.2 uh, power 22 which is an uh, absolutely ridiculous number. And I had really big, big troubles to understand what is going on, uh, on a, how it's possible that uh, money just lose value uh, so much. I remember once um, I, was, uh, I was renting, I was a kid and I was renting a, a Terminator 2 uh, uh, VHS tape and bringing it back after a couple of days of being late. And when I calculate how much it cost, uh, and I asked my grandmother to, to, to give me that, she, cal she calculated it was the cost of her whole salary. So basically, at the worst period of hi hyperinflation, uh, 
for the whole salary you could rent a videotape for a couple of days or buy one liter of, uh, of, of milk. Also what is interesting what happened in terms of like shifting values is that uh, now this is the addition the, uh, just before the, the end of hyperinflation and you can see that there, there are no any more anonymous uh, per persona. Uh, uh, now we have national heroes, uh, great Serbian leaders, um, and all it, it's all about uh, communicating the, the nationalist, nationalist rhetoric. And it's directly visible, uh, visible on the banknote. Uh, from the back side of the banknote now, the, they, they, they put the monasteries and, and, uh, and it, the banknote become basically a flyer communicating uh, state, uh, state policy. How it, it, end, uh, it ended in late uh, January, to 24 January 2000, uh, 1994. And for me, it was really, yeah, it was difficult to understand uh, all that. How, you know, you, you start growing up and, uh, and, uh, and voila, parents and, and society try to teach you that money is, uh, is representing value. And when you hold a bill in your hands, that um, it has actually, that it's a location of the value. And uh, and it's only when I cross about the wonderful uh, short story from Thomas Mann, who's, uh, who speak about hypermigration in Germany in uh, in, in early twenties uh, uh, of last century, that I really understand what is going on. It's a, the, it's a hyperinflation brought us such amount of uncertainty that uh, everything. Uh, that it was impossible to locate uh, locate uh, po po individual positions into in, within the society, uh, and everything has everything start changing its position. For example, in concrete story, uh, he speaks about uh, uh, family where kids are becoming grandparents and grandparents are be becoming kids, and this is exactly the feeling I remember from my experience of hyperinflation. It's a society where police becoming mafia, where mafia becoming police, where uh, doctors becoming butchers and butchers becoming doctors and politicians, criminals and criminals, politicians, everything is, it's, it's a state of high entropy. You cannot locate the, the value and, uh, or you cannot predict where, where it is uh, heading. And th this is one of, as you know, the uncertainty principle from, from um, uh, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's about this, it's about uh, this uh, complementary variables uh, lock, uh, on a quantum level, which, uh, which tells you if you are trying to locate where the particle is, where you, more you are trying to locate, you, you are more losing uh, its, its direction and uh, vice versa. Uh, this, this is concretely how I, as an artist, translated this, uh, this uh, into a uh, wall installation. Uh, so we can, we started with the first edition of Dinar in uh, 1884. And uh, then the inflation um, uh, inflation and all the new editions of the banknotes until the moment uh, are just a representations of the banknotes until the moment the hyperinflation started. And there it's a bottom line, uh, first, uh, first foot on the left. It, it's, it's actually where the cut sta uh, starts and the banknote uh, start being uh, uh, any reference to, to representation of value, but they become a psychological space. And from, from uh, then on, onward, we have a, a line of drawings actually deconstructing the visual space of the, of the, of the money uh, uh, in, in, a, in a way that uh, there is a feeling of loss of logic and we are entering a new space. It, the hyperinflation ended with, uh, with um, uh, with, uh, not not uh, not not uh, Gauss, but uh, Gauss was on on a ten ten bill of uh, German mark, and German mark uh, was finally used as a hard currency to to stop uh, hyperinflation, and dinar was linked or entangled directly to to the German mark, which is also there is something really esoteric in this, um, as you uh, you know the. Uh, the bill of 10 where the Gauss was depicted was the most popular bill used on in everyday life. And uh, we all remember this and from other side, he, Gauss as a physician and mathematician 
who is who is able actually to stop this uh, this hyperinflation. Uh, there is something ironic, at least, uh, in this. Uh, the, there is a small booklet of uh, just to illustrate you how much this ridiculous number of um, of 3.5 uh, power 22. It's uh, so if and come that's a amount that uh, that's a number that dinner actually lost value in 24 months. So just hypothetically, if you buy a one one meter uh, long USB cable for one dinner in 1994, uh, how for how long USB cable for one for the same dinner could uh, you could be able to buy uh, 24 months uh, before? And the answer is actually that long that you could connect with any device in Andromeda Galaxy. <laughs> uh, then we, we uh, the hyperinflation was a really fair, like as a personal experience was a fertile ground to, to develop this uh, feeling of uh, uh, to further have to examine this uh, feeling of uncertainty um, and being unable to locate the value uh, in economy and art and i have created a um, i have created a currency which is a my it's a bank of uncertainty actually uh, which is pub publishing its own uh, currency, which is called MindNote. And the MindNote has only three rules. It doesn't have uh, any physical institution. And the three only three rules are uh, that MindNote, MindNote is self-issued at the moment when visual trace is applied uh, on it. It values everything as everything and nothing at the same time. And the third falsification is not prohibited because it's impossible. And uh, the creation of this money was direct result of an encounter with a street poet in, in streets of Paris, who came to me with a, with a small poem written on a piece of paper. And uh, he told me, uh, would you mind to buy this bad poem uh, for two euros or as much as you, as you have? And I say, ask, but why should I? Uh, it, why should I buy bad poem? You know, normally when we speak about trade and so on, you go to buy. You know, you're trying to communicate values, uh, not an opposite, uh, not not downsides. And uh, and I was I, I was shocked. I mean, this really. Uh, he he told me exactly because it's a bad. You know, uh, and uh, uh, the the only way it can go, it can go better. Um, uh, and it really helps the declenche uh, trigger something uh, to 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 so, so the so here is the example that the, the people they can you take a marker or pencil and you you can draw or drive whatever it is uh, whatever you want on on, on back side and it immediately generates the value of the paper here is another example tackling some of categories of in economy from this position so uh, in this con concrete uh, case, it's about growth uh, or uh, gross domestic growth. And here we have the two growth lines, which are exposed top on top of each other and at the same scale uh, of like uncertain scale. Uh, and the first one, it's it's my personal <laughs> growth. Uh, so since I'm born in 1996, so you can see the the first line on top. Nothing is change since I've become a starting working a little bit teenager, some uh, art well, professionals, and then I got some job, I lost lose job, and I starting to find again. And the second line uh, from top down is, um, is the growth of my family, uh, which had some ups in Yugoslavia, then completely co collapse in the 90s and start growing again and so on. The third one is about uh, my, my first country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I grew up, uh, which had actually the biggest grow production uh, in the 80s and then completely collapsed uh, in the 90s and then it still didn't come back uh, to pre-war uh, production. And the fourth one is the, the growth of the, of the world, average uh, growth of the world, which is a more or less a constant all the time. Uh, didn't, this is installation in 2018, so it's, the crisis is not counted now. Uh, these are two examples. How much? How much no, no, minutes? No. I'm yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, I just wanted to say you're now, I think, three or four minutes over your ten okay. minutes time. Okay. So, I, so I, I guess so. I'll ask you to maybe uh, wrap finish. up briefly. 
go through the last examples, but let's see. Yes, I, I have two, only two of this I will skip, so we can go to, to these two. Just to, uh, just to conclude, the, so actually the feeling of uns uh, uncertainty, feeling of uncertainty, it's not something that uh, society is, um, uh, should deal occasionally when it appears. This is actually the landscape on, to on top, uh, of, uh, with, top of which the, the society is co constructed. It existed all the time, and uh, now uh, every flux every flux shape uh, have say change in this field. Actually, we we feel strongly, and I would just recommend you the if you probably you read it's one of the most popular book uh, Risk Society from Uli Be Uli Beck, uh, which uh, speaks about um, uh, how society deals with uh, with uncertainty, and uh, these are two representations of Fortuna and. Uh, and Anglo-Saxon God Crodo, uh, which also deal with uh, with destiny and uh, being incapable to define, predict posi future positions of the system, which is completely obsession and it's a part of deep culture of, of society. Voila. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks a lot, and and don't worry for having gone a little bit over time. So, uh, but thanks for for sharing your your insights with us.